Hey everybody, we're going to uh, give everyone a couple of minutes to get uh, joined here and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started um, talking about hydroxychloroquine and some observational and some randomized control trial data. So hopefully we'll get a good sense for it by the end. Okay, we have a pretty good group here, so um, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, one of Cabby team, I'm going to switch up the order a little bit, um, and I think we can start with some of the randomized trials. Um, and so I'll just kind of call people out, and you can um, jump in and and talk about um, the studies that you summarized. And so let's start with Ashley. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Let's see. Uh, Ryan, it looks like I'm unable to do screen sharing right now. Okay, that should be better. Great. Yep, that did it. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, my study was hydroxychloroquine for early treatment of adults with mild COVID-19, and it's a randomized controlled trial. So this multi-center randomized controlled trial was conducted in Catalonia, Spain from March 17th to May 26th. The authors assessed the effectiveness of hydrochloroquine or HCQ on mild non-hospitalized COVID-19 cases. Okay, so individuals were identified through the Epidemiological Surveillance Emergency Service of Catalonia, uh, which is an electronic registry that is notified of all regional COVID-19 cases. 293 participants were eligible for the study, which meant that they were non-hospitalized individuals and they had less than five days since symptom onset. And then they were randomly selected by a computer generator for either the HCQ intervention or the control arm. 
136 were therefore assigned to the HCQ, and 157 were assigned uh, no antiviral treatment, not placebo controlled. 800 milligrams of HCQ was administered on day one with an additional 400 milligrams per day for six days. Uh, nasal pharyngeal and serial oral swabs were collected on days one, three, and seven. Okay, so the study outcomes they looked at were the viral RNA load in the swabs at um, up to seven days post-treatment. So again, looking at the one, three, and seven days, and then the disease progression up to 28 days using the World Health Organization scale, and they also looked at duration of symptoms. Oops, sorry, that's the discussion. Let me do the results first. That'll probably make more sense. All right. So overall, they didn't really find any significant results. So starting with day three, there was no difference in reduction in viral load between the intervention and the control arms. There was a difference of 0 0.01 with the 95% confidence interval of 0.28 to 0.29. On day seven, they again found no difference in reduction of the viral load between intervention and um, control arms, a difference of negative 0.07 with a 95% confidence interval of negative 0.44 to 0.29. They found no reduction in risk of hospitalization with 7.1% in, in the control versus 5.9% intervention and relative risk um, of 0.75 with the 97, or I'm sorry, 95% confidence interval of 0.32 um, to 1.77. And they also found no shortened duration of symptoms with 12 days in control versus 10 in intervention. Um, and the log rank test for survival analysis had a p-value of 0.38. So I think I double clicked that. Okay. So overall, the demographics were pretty um, comparable between the two age groups, or I'm sorry, between the two um, study arms, in, which included age gender, comorbidity, symptoms, and nasal pharyngeal viral load. So the mean age was about 42 years old, 69% women, 87% uh, were healthcare workers with a mean baseline viral load of 7.9, SD of 1.82, log 10 copies per milliliter. And median time from symptom onset to enrollment was three days. And so this is an accepted manuscript, so apologies in advance for the blue writing, but here's their table one, with the first column being um, assigned to control arm, again with that sample of 157, and then assigned to intervention with that sample of 136. And then uh, they had the individual characteristics, any coexisting disease, symptoms at baseline, the lab data, which included that viral load, and then the main risk factor of exposure to COVID-19, again, with the emphasis that most of them were uh, healthcare workers. Okay. So then their figure one is really just looking at who was included in the sample. So start, starting off with the 753 um, that were originally confirmed using that database and then narrowing it all the way down to who ended up in the control arm on the left versus the intervention arm on the right. So that's just the general um, overall flow diagram for that selection process. And then Figure two is the change from baseline in SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA on nasopharyngeal swabs intention to treat. And this shows a box plot of the viral load of participants in the control arm, where the control arm is the blue box and the treatment arm is the red box at each assessment point on the x-axis determined by quantitative RT-PCR. The boxes represent median and IQR for each group. Outliers are plotted as individual points. And the number of samples tested are as follows. Day one had 293, day three had 271, and day seven had 211. Um, day seven was not included in the original protocol for the study. 
It was only after conducting the study for a while they realized they needed to go further than day three. And so that's part of the reason why day seven was lower sample size, since they missed some of those earlier um, patients who were past day seven by that point. And finally, figure three. <clears throat> figure three is the time to clinical improvement from randomization with intent to treat. And this shows the survival curve of participants in the control arm, uh, which is the blue line again. Median is 12 and the IQR is six to 21. And then in the intervention arm, which again is the red line with the median of 10 and IQR of four to 18. And again, that long rate test uh, revealed a p-value of 0.38. Okay, and then so, further discussion, there were no significant differences observed between the study outcomes among the intervention versus the controlled arms. Uh, this study was unable to determine any benefit of HCQ treatment to outpatients with mild COVID-19 beyond usual care. And then some study limitations. Uh, so masking was not possible in the study. There was no time to prepare a placebo. And the study was underpowered for the risk of hospitalization outcome. Uh, clinical assessments on day seven, again, were not included in the original protocol. So that resulted in a lower sample analysis. World Health Organization has not established an optimal time to measure viral load or threshold reduction between the control and intervention arms. And also there was an overrepresentation of healthcare workers. They um, composed about 87% of the study population and that may affect generalizability. So that's the end of my summary. Does anyone have any questions based on that? Thanks, Ashley. Good summary. So, um, the did the authors mention anything um, in the discussion? Sort of about obviously. So it's underpowered. Um, I know that you said that, um, but so you know, obviously the magnitude of the effect was small, even if it's not statistically significant. Sort of regardless, like the magnitude of the difference. So did they did they talk about that as like a they don't believe there's any difference because of the, the magnitude of effect, or, or did they just sort of say they were underpowered and that's why they didn't detect an effect? Yeah, it was more that they were underpowered. So let me see. So when they talked about the study outcomes, the main part of their study was to look at the viral load. And hospitalization was more so one of those secondary factors they looked at. So they talked about um, just the essentially like the focus of power and the importance in the study. And they talked about it more so in selecting their sample size because of their main outcomes. And then pretty much just said that there was more, more studies needed to be conducted to kind of analyze those other things as well. But yeah. Great, thanks. Um, any other questions for Ashley? Um, I was wondering, I know this doesn't necessarily have like bearing on the outcomes, but why did they end up with so many healthcare workers? Was it just like a fluke? They didn't do it on purpose or anything? Yeah, they didn't really talk about that. Um, I was a little surprised as well. I was wondering, I've seen a lot of other papers where they just um, essentially because of the way testing is done. Mm -hmm. And especially when it was so early on with the pandemic, I think a lot of it just happened to be that they were screening healthcare providers so frequently um, in comparison to the rest of the population. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, because this, um, this uh, epidemiological surveillance emergency service of Catalonia, this included everyone who tested positive for COVID. Mm -hmm. So it would have um, included the original, essentially, source population was anyone who tested positive in this region. So um, unfortunately, they had, again, they had, I think, like 750 or so people who were eligible. And they only ended up with about 300 um, participants. Mm -hmm. So I think it was one of those as well. Hospital workers were more likely to want to be involved. Yeah, that's probably true too. But yeah, they didn't, they didn't really discuss that other than it might limit their study findings, mm -hmm. which, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa.
Hey, Ashley, that, that was a good presentation. And just to follow up on that, I, I think it is interesting that they have such a high number of healthcare workers, because I would assume that means, I mean, they talk about some of the coexisting disease, but healthcare workers to be doing that job, you would need to be at least somewhat relatively healthy. So I do wonder uh, with a different type of population, maybe we might see a different outcome. Um, whereas with these, they're, they will be not young, but not some of the more at-risk po population for more serious disease. So I, I, I would be curious to see a study like this, but with a, a, um, a population that include more at-risk uh, people. Yeah, absolutely. I was also wondering if the fact that they had to be under five days since symptom onset, if it was just easier to catch the hospital workers since they were already there. Um, but yeah, that's a great point as well. Yeah. Great. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I can stop sharing and we can hand it over to the next person. Great, thanks. Um, all right, so let's go on then next to um, uh, Brianna, who will talk about the recovery trial. Maybe it's quite a while ago, but. Cool. Hey guys, um, I'm Brianna. I'm a rising sophomore at Smith College, and I'm a neuroscience and linguistics major. And I thought like this week's um, topic was kind of interesting because of the the sort of um, like the news surrounding hydroxychloroquine and yeah so I'll share my screen okay can you guys see that yes okay Perfect. Um, so my paper was the effect of hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 preliminary results from a multicentral randomized, multi-center randomized controlled trial. So basically, um, this was a randomized controlled trial that took place across 176 hospitals in the UK, and they compared the outcome of patients who received the usual care plus hydroxychloroquine to the outcome of patients who just received the usual care um, by itself. And then this was over the period of 28 days or until discharge or until death, whichever one came first um, for each patient. Um, the findings didn't demonstrate any significant association between hydroxychloroquine and um, reduction in a 28-day mortality. Um, and additionally, hydroxychloroquine was correlated with increased duration until discharge and greater risk of progression into invasive mechanical ventilation and death. So I have a brief outline of the um, method. So um, recovery is a randomized controlled open label platform trial that involves 176 hospitals um, in the United Kingdom. Um, the one I'll be talking about today is obviously the hydroxychloroquine branch of that. Um, so this study was done on um, hospitalized COVID-19 patients with clinically suspected or laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and this excluded patients with prolonged electrocardiograph QTC intervals. Um, the variables taken into account for randomization were age, sex, level of respiratory support required before the trial, um, days since symptom onset, and predicted 28-day mortality risks. And this was um, assessed um, and estimated with a 95% confidence interval. Um, so there were 1,561 um, patients randomly allocated to receive hydroxychloroquine and 3,155 patients who um, were randomly allocated to uh, receive the usual, the usual care by itself. Um, the patients who received hydroxychloroquine were given a loading dose of 800 milligrams at eight, uh, sorry, zero and six hours. Um, and 400 milligrams were given 12 hours after the initial dose and every 12 hours for the next nine days or until uh, discharge or death, whichever came first. 
um, and an online follow-up form was to be completed once the patients were discharged, had died, or at, um, after 28 days. So for the results, um, the primary outcome was that there is no significant difference in outcome between patients who received hydroxychloroquine and those who did not. Um, in terms of secondary outcomes, there was a longer time until discharge alive, a lower probability of discharge alive, and a higher probability of requiring invasive mechanical ventilation if they did not already require it before the trial. Um, so some subsidiary, some subsidiary, subsidiary outcomes um, were a uh, new major cardiac arrhythmia, increased use of hemodialysis or hemofiltration, and increased duration of ventilation. Um, and then so uh, the discussion from this study is that uh, the results suggest that hydroxychloroquine is not an effective treatment for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Um, there, is, there was little difference um, in the primary outcome between the patients who received hydroxychloroquine and those who did not. Um, and the patients who received hydroxychloroquine also had a long duration of hospital stay and an increased risk of requiring invasive mechanical ventilation and death. Um, and as a result, these trials have been discontinued since June 5th, 2020. And then for the limitations. Um, so even though these findings suggest that hydroxychloroquine is ineffective for hospitalized COVID-19 patients, it doesn't address its use as a prophylactic treatment or its use for patients with less severe COVID-19 that can be managed in the community. These trials were also not blinded or placebo controlled and usual standard of care and the criteria for discharge were not operatively defined. So yes, that is my presentation. Does anybody have any questions for me? Um, I have a question. Uh, did they explain why there was like such a big difference in size between the groups they were comparing? Um, they didn't explain why they chose to do a two to one ratio. Um, I know that they did it on purpose, um, but they didn't really explain it. I'm assuming I'm going to take a guess and say that it's because they probably want, they might want people um, who like more people to be on the standard of care that has already been established instead of a more um, experimental um, thing, just okay. to limit the amount of people who could be at risk, I guess. Yeah, okay, thank you. Cool, good question, anyone else? Cool, so if there's no other questions, I guess I will stop sharing my screen. And yeah, let the next person go. Thanks, thanks, Brianna, that was good. And then the, it's actually a, from the discussion there, it's a good transition to the, the next study, which Emily can present on the uh, PrEP trial, uh, okay. post-exposure exposure prophylaxis. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, so today I'm presenting on a New England General Journal of Medicine article um, about a randomized trial of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19. So the purpose of this study was to determine if hydroxychloroquine can prevent symptomatic infection after a SARS-CoV-2 exposure. And it was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial conducted in the USA and in Canada. Um, it was aimed to test hydrochloroquine as a post-exposure prophylaxis. And this trial was focused on adults who had been exposed to someone with a confirmed COVID-19 case at a distance of six feet or less for more than 10 minutes without wearing a fa face mask or face shield. And to qualify for the study, the patient had to be exposed but not show any symptoms. And 
they had to enroll within the study within four days of exposure. The purpose of enrolling within the four days was to intervene before the median incubation period of five to six days of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And if they were experiencing symptoms, then they were excluded to, from this trial and enrolled in a separate clinical trial. For the sample, the recruitment of patients occurred through so social media and it was a wide variety of people that had experienced COVID through family members within the same household or um, doctors or PAs in, from their patients. Um, this figure shows that 6,924 persons were eligible at the beginning for the study and then about 2,000 ended up testing positive. And in the end, 821 were asymptomatic and were included in the analysis. Um, 414 were assigned to receive the hydroxychloroquine and 407 were to receive the placebo. The study started on March 17th, 2020, where there was the enrollment of the 821 and the patients were expected to respond to follow-up emails sent on days 1, 5, 10, and 14. Um, also a survey sent four to six weeks following their exposure. So there was no direct contact. It was all over the internet. And this figure shows the demographics of the participants. So the average age was about 40 with about 50% both male and female, and there were some smokers within the particip participant group. So for the dosage of hydroxychloroquine, the participants were randomly assigned to receive either the placebo or the hydroxychloroquine, and the dosage was 800 milligrams on the first day followed by 600 milligrams in six to eight hours after the first dose, then 600 milligrams daily for an additional four days. So there was a total course of five days. The dosage was chosen because it was thought to achieve plasma concentrations above the SARS-CoV-2 concentration at 14 days. The placebo tablets were prescribed in an identical regimen and both were shipped overnight to the patient after they had been exposed. For patient outcomes, 13 of the participants were either PCR confirmed or had compatible COVID-19 symptoms that developed during the 14th day follow-up. There was no significant difference according to the data gathered that, that, that between the people that received the hydroxychloroquine and then those that received the placebo. Um, 49 from the hydroxychloroquine group out of the 414 tested positive or had symptoms and 58 from the placebo group out of 407. And the p-value was 0.35 with absolute difference of negative 2.4%. Um, this was, there were some safety concerns with the hydroxychloroquine as 40.1% of that group reported side effects by day five and only 16.8 um, from the placebo group reported symptoms. Uh, the most reported symptoms were nausea, loose stools, and abdominal discomfort. There were some issues within this clinical trial because some people taking the hydroxychloroquine decided that the, since they had some abdominal discomfort that they were gonna stop it. So there might be some um, limitations with this study according to that. And this, this figure shows the um, trial days with the percent of new COVID-19 uh, infections within the participant group. And the uh, conclusion is that no meaningful difference is effective according to the time starting the post-exposure prophylaxis. And the conclusion of this study was that high doses of hydroxychloroquine did not prevent illness compatible with COVID-19 when initiated within four days after a high risk or moderate risk exposure. And does anyone have any questions?
Okay, well, thank you. And we'll go on to the next presenter. Thanks, Emily. Um, so those are the three papers that we had this week for um, randomized trials of hydroxychloroquine. Um, so now we'll move into the observational data and um, Samantha will lead us off. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see it. Um, so hi, I'm Samantha Del Imperio. I'm a rising sophomore at Syracuse University, where I study biology and medical anthropology. So for this presentation, I'll be summarizing a paper called Observational Study of Hydroxychloroquine in Hospitalized Patients with COVID-19 from the New England Journal of Medicine. So a bit of background about the drug. So safer and more potent in antiviral properties than chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine has been widely used for the treatment of malaria and rheumatic diseases. Mm -hmm. Due to its anti-inflammatory and antiviral effects, some sources also claim it can serve as effective treatment for COVID-19. On March 30th, 2020, the US FDA issued an emergency use authorization, which suggested using these drugs for patients with pneumonia. And after this event, HCQ has been widely used to treat COVID-19 patients around the world. However, no robust clinical studies have supported the effectiveness of this treatment. So about this particular study, um, so from March 7th to April 8th, 2020, researchers observed the association between HCQ treatment and respiratory failure and confirmed COVID-19 patients at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Patients were categorized as having been exposed to HCQ if administered the drug at any point after the study baseline, which is 24 hours after being admitted to the emergency department and before intubation or death. Researchers hypothesized that HCQ would be associated with a lower risk of a composite endpoint intubation or death after adjusting for and weighing the compounded variables. So about the study's sample, um, sorry, one second. So this sample is hospitalized patients with acute SARS-CoV-2 who had been diagnosed via MP or OP swab during hospitalization from March 7th to April 8th, 2020. Excluded from the sample are patients who were intubated, who had died, or who were transferred to another department within 24 hours of being brought to the emergency department. So of the original 1,446 COVID-19 patients admitted to the hospital during this time, only 1,376 were included in the analysis. And so you can see here um, how that happened, how 70 were excluded due to intubation, death, or transferal to another facility. So that's the sample. And with any observational study, it's important to note the confounding variables. So these researchers found it important to note specifically in each patient, age, sex, patient reported race and ethnic group, current insurance carrier, first recorded vital signs on presentation, the ratio of the partial pressure of arterial oxygen to the fraction of inspired oxygen, first recorded BMI, first recorded inpatient lab tests, past and current diagnoses, patient reported smoking status, and the medication administration at baseline. And so you can see the characteristics of the patients in this figure. So you can see almost half of them are age 60, to 79, about half of them are female, about half of them are Hispanic. Um, their BMIs are half around um, 25 to 39.9. About half of them have Medicare. Um, a lot of them smoke. This is the percentage that don't. It's only 11 or 12 percent. Um, as for other um, pre-existing conditions, Almost half of them have hypertension in the HCQ group. Um, for medications at baseline, the HCQ group has higher rates of um, receiving systemic glucocorticoids, um, azithromycin, and other antibiotic agents. And you can just see um, their initial vitals and their initial lab tests. So those are the variables. And now for who received the treatment and when. Um, so, sorry, 
Um, so of the 1,376 patients, 811 or 58.9 percent received HCQ and 565 did not. So among the ones who did receive treatment, 45.8% um, received it within 24 hours between their arrival at the emergency department and the start of the study follow-up, and 85.9% received it within, 24, between, um, within 48 hours after arriving at the emergency department. In the match analytic sample, 811 patients received HCQ and 274 did not. Um, so now in terms of the patient outcomes, um, so among the 1,376 patients included in the analysis, the primary endpoint of respiratory failure developed in 346, or about 25% of patients, with 180 being intubated and 166 dying without intubation. So after accounting for the confounding variables, they found that there was no significant association between hydroxychloroquine use and the composite primary endpoint. Um, and you can see in this figure here, as the 30 days go on, initially it seems like hydroxychloroquine yields a slightly higher probability of the patients being event-free, but then as time goes on, no ice um, HCQ treatment actually is slightly higher, gives a slightly higher probability of being event-free. And the lines are so closely similar that you can see there's really no um, definite benefit to using the HCQ for treatment. And the gray area here is just the 95% confidence interval. So those are the patient outcomes. And finally, for some limitations of this study, um, the limitations might include things like missing data for some confounding variables, as well as the potential for inaccuracies in the electric, electronic health records, such as lack of documentation of smoking or the pre-existing conditions for some patients. Um, the single center design of the study might limit the generalizability of these results. And as the study is observational, its results can't be taken to reveal a definite benefit or harm to HCQ treatment, although the results do not support the use of HCQ treatment um, for COVID-19 at this time. So that's my summary. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. If not, I can stop sharing my screen and hand it off. What do we think about the uh... I guess Peter, Khalil, Josh, Kat, what do we think about the uh, the early potential effect there in those in those Kaplan Meyer curves? Anybody have a thought? Can we bring up the figures again, or I? Maybe I can't see them. Sorry, yeah, let me just share again. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so do you mean this figure right here? Just, yeah, that red and blue graph just to the back, that plot. Uh, could this it one? be, could it be in part because the, I think they said the, the hydroxychloroquine um, group were, um, I think they were more ill. Is that what they said? I, I don't remember now what I read. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so when they looked at the past diagnoses, you can see here that they, the HCQ group actually had significantly higher rates of numerous other um, diseases. So that can be a compounding variable. Could that explain some of the earlier effects? Because you're having some um people who might be more susceptible to serious illness in that group um that they're the ones who or am I, i'm reading it the wrong way maybe yeah so they said with statistical analysis that they did account for compounding variables and that they did um propensity score matching um but obviously they can't, because it's an observational study, they can't completely control for these variables. And you can see that there are significant differences in the 
diagnoses, as well as the medications that they're taking. So yeah. Ryan, are you asking why the group got receiving the hydroxychloroquine at least early on seemed to be event free at a higher rate than the group that did not receive hydroxychloroquine? Ryan, you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Um, is, was that what you were asking? Uh, like why it looks like at least early on the, the group receiving hydroxychloroquine were having less events than the yep, group that was not receiving the hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, that's what I was asking. If anybody has any, if anybody thinks that there is, could think of an uh, a reason why that might be, I guess, or. If they think it's a real effect or just sort of a. I mean, there is some overlap with the, at least on that figure from the confidence intervals. It could just be a random thing, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I agree. It's a small, I mean, it's a small difference. So it might not be anything real. But it's just, it was interesting to me, I guess, that it, it looked like there was some benefit early. But then it, it clearly switches. And when it switches, yeah. it, it seems to like gradually, I, I don't know if they would have had more people we, or, or a longer follow up, but it seems to gradually separate uh, more as time goes on. And what do we think about the violation of proportional hazards here? <laughs> Definitely, definitely the crossing lines is a problem, but. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, if nobody else has any comments about this, uh, we'll move on to Amanda's paper and then we'll finish with Sierra um, coming back from her brief hiatus as a One Academy presenter to talk about the Henry Ford study. Thank you, Ryan. Um, hi, my name is Amanda Sherwood. I am a rising junior at the University of South Florida, and I am currently studying cellular and molecular biology. Um, I just want to give a small disclaimer. Since I do live in Florida, it's thundering awfully right now. So if you hear any bangs or crashes uh, in the background, I just want to let you know what's up. So let me share my screen. OK. Okay, give me one second. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay, good, thank you. So um, as we've all rehashed, uh, the debate is that some studies find a positive effect with patients upon administering um, hydroxychloroquine and or other antibiotics like azithromycin. Um, and some studies show that there's little to no difference or improvement in um, treatment. 
So uh, the article that I summarized is in favor of administering hydroxychloroquine. And in addition to administering HCQ, they also advocate for administering azithromycin. Um, and this is what you see here. It's um, a uncontrolled non-comparative observational study that was conducted in Marseille, France in March, 2020. And um, even though it is an observational study, it's less of, or even though the title says that it's an observational study, it's a bit misleading. It's more of um, just a description of what's happening as physicians are administering different combinations of, <clears throat> of drugs and this is the combination that they um, decided to go with. So they observed and treated a cohort of 80 mild COVID-19 patients and they also concurrently evaluated the synergy between hydro hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in, in vitro and um, through that researchers saw a rapid decline in nasopharyngeal viral load and a decrease in viral carriage duration. Um, along, with, along with these findings, the main reason why that they chose these two drugs to focus on was that um, it's a popular strategy in treating COVID-19 patients to repurpose existing drugs, as there's already extensive knowledge on the drug safety profile, side effects, drug interactions, etc. Um, in addition to that, there is some popularity in um, physicians administering drugs like these or very similar kinds like uh, chloroquine sulfate and so on and so forth. So first, um, here are the methods. The methods, there are, they are quite long, so I'm only going to go into depth over the main ones that I find important, like the classification and follow-up, COVID treatment, criteria for discharge, contagiousness, and outcomes. So here they are. Okay, so upon admission, give me one second. Okay. So upon admission, patients were grouped into two categories, those with uh, upper respiratory tract infection and those with lower respiratory tract infection. The time between the onset of symptoms and admissions, the time between the onset of symptoms and treatment was documented, and lastly, risk factors for severe COVID-19 were also documented. Um, the National Early Warning Score, or NEWS, for patients was also collected upon admission and during follow-ups. And this is um, calculated by age, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, systolic blood pressure, pulse rate, and level of consciousness. And the three risk, uh, risk categories for clinical deterioration were defined as low score, a new score being of zero to four, a medium score being five to six, and a high score greater than or equal to seven for COVID patients. Lastly, the need for oxygen therapy transferred to the ICU, death, and length of stay in the ID ward were, were documented. Um, with chest computed to, uh, tomography, this was just basically a low-dose CT scan um, to determine whether or not patients um, presented with a lower respiratory tract infection, and one of the ways in which that presents is pneumonia. So here it is here. And then the PCR assay was a method of quantifying um, viral load in patients via uh, nasopharyngeal swabbing. And the cultures, these were performed on um, swab samples of a select number of patients. And the researchers were looking for a cytopathogenic effect between the SARS-CoV-2 collected from patients and the Vero E6 cells. And then for COVID-19 treatment, um, this was the protocol that physicians followed um, in this study. So patients with no contraindications were offered a combination of 200 milligrams of oral HCQ sulfate three times per day for 10 days combined with AZM, uh, 500 milligrams on the first day followed by 200 milligrams daily for the next four days. For patients with pneumonia and a new score greater than or equal to five, a broad spectrum antibiotic was also added to HCQ and AZM, 
and 12 lead electrocardiograms were performed on each patient before treatment and two days after the treatment began. And this is because there is um, a history of complications with patients ha that have underlying conditions if they are administer uh, administered HCQ. So the treatment was either not started or discontinued when the QTC or Bezet's formula was greater than 500 milliseconds. Symptomatic treatments, including oxygen, were added when needed, and an ionogram and verification of serum pot potassium levels were regularly performed upon admission. When needed, standard blood chemistry was checked. And then the criteria for discharge was that initially patients that um, tested negative uh, for P, uh, via PCR assay twice with the CT value greater than or equal to 35 were discharged. Um, because of a crucial need to admit new and treated inpatients, they modified this to inpatients already receiving treatment with the PCR CT value less than 34 with good clinical outcome and good clinical adherence to treatment. Um, and patients with a single uh, nasopharyngeal sample with a PCR CT value less or greater than or equal to 34 were discharged to their homes or transferred to other units for continuing treatment. Then you have your criteria of contagiousness. Uh, patients with a PCR CT value of less than 34 were considered to be contagious. And the outcomes for this study were an aggressive clinical course requiring oxygen therapy or transfer to the ICU after at least three days of treatment, contagiousness as assessed by PCR and culture, and a length of stay in the infectious disease ward. So here are the results. Um, the mean time between the onset of symptoms and the initiation of treatment was 4.9 days. A total of 79 out of 80 patients received treatment on a daily basis throughout the whole study period. And um, there was one patient who unfortunately did pass during this study. Um, they were a patient that was over the age of 86 and had already come into um, the institute presenting with a quite severe case of COVID-19. Whereas this study um, advocates for the use of uh, this combination of drugs with mild COVID patients. So, um, 65 patients had favorable outcome and they were discharged from the unit at the time of writing with low new scores. And um, there was a significant decrease of nasopharyngeal viral load tested by qPCR with 83% negative at day seven and 93% at day eight. The number of patients contagious steadily decreased over time and reached zero on day 12. And the mean time from initiation to discharge was 4.1 days with the mean stay of 4.6 days for the 65 patients who were discharged during the study period. And here, oops, here uh, there are just three tables. So the first one um, talks, the first one goes over the sociodemographic characteristics and chronic conditions here. And then the second one goes through the clinical status at admission. So the majority presenting with an upper or lower respiratory tract infection. I mean, yes, tract infection, small number of patients were asymptomatic. Also small number of patients presented with a fever. And lastly, the treatment and outcome. So a significant portion of patients were discharged. Only one person was still in the ICU at the time of writing. And these were um, all the other outcomes for the patients. So the discussion, um, according to the authors, COVID-19 poses two major challenges to physicians. And the first one is therapeutic management of patients and the rapid spread of the disease in population through contagious individuals. So in this context, um, it's necessary to avoid a worsening evolution because it, it usually occurs around the 10th day and may result in acute respiratory distress syndrome um, and the prognosis of which is poor, whatever the cause. So um, not only is it an objective to just treat patients, but to primarily treat people who have a moderate or severe infection at an early enough stage um, to avoid progression to a serious and irreversible condition. And then with, um, <clears throat> um, with the rapid spread of the disease, 
um, the elimination of viral carriage in the human reservoir of the virus has recently been recognized as a priority. So um, the rapid decrease in positivity in cultures from patients' respiratory samples under treatment with HCQ plus AZM that supports an effectiveness of this combination. Um, and this combination can play a role in controlling the disease, of the, uh, the disease by limiting the duration of the virus shedding, which can last for several weeks in absence of specific treatment. And so the results of this study, in addition to vast extensive knowledge on hand about HCQ and AZM and the negligible costs of both drugs, lead researchers to advocate for further exploration and research about these two drugs and its effectiveness in treating COVID-19 patients early. So here I'll go to the limitations and I'll also show the figures associated with the discussion. So here's the first one. This is um, SARS-CoV-2 PCR from nasopharyngeal samples over time. The black bar represents the number of patients with available results. The gray bar, the number of patients with a PCR CT value less than 34, so positive. And the solid line is the percent of patient, the percentage of patients um, with positive values. And the dashed line is a logarithmic regression curve. So you can see here, there's a significant downward trend. And then here, there's also um, SARS-CoV-2 culture from nasopharyngeal samples over time. And um, as per the previous figure, the black bars represent the number of patients with available results. The gray bar is the patient, the number of patients with positive culture, and the solid line is the percentage of patients with the positive culture. And um, as we see, like with the first figure, this figure also shows a downward trend. And lastly, the limitations. So this um, is a descriptive pilot study conducted in only 80 patients with relatively mild clinical presentation. And the researchers didn't really attempt an analytic approach to account for possible confounding factors, um, including the severity of illness. So such an approach is currently planned in a larger set of patients under treatment at the institute in which the study took place. And I think those are all the notes I have. Does anybody have any questions? Thanks, Amanda. I think we'll just jump right into uh, Sierra's presentation since uh, we're pretty short on time here. So um, thanks, that was a great. Oh, great presentation, great summary. Take it away, Sierra. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll try to get through this quick, but I do have quite a bit of information to share. So um, this study was at the Henry Ford Health System Hospital Network, um, and it was a retrospective observational study that looked to evaluate evaluate the role of hydroxychloroquine therapy alone and in combination with azithromycin in hospitalized patients that were positive for COVID-19. And based on their algorithm among hospitalized patients, the use of hydroxychloroquine alone and in combination with azithromycin was associated with a significant reduction in hospital mortality compared to not receiving any hydroxychloroquine. Um, so we can look at how point they evaluated clinical outcomes of all consecutive patients within the hospital system being treated for COVID-19 from March 10th to May 2nd. And for patients that had multiple COVID-19 admissions, they only included the first admission. Um, and they defined COVID-related ad admission as anyone who was hospitalized with a positive reverse transcriptase PCR test. All patients were at least 18 years old, and they were all inpatients for at least 48 hours unless they died within that 48 hours. Um, electronic medical records were used for demographics and clinical characteristics. And a key point of this study is that um, despite it being an observational study, the treatment protocol was very consistent um, and driven throughout all of the hospitals included in the study. So for everyone given hydroxychloroquine, it was dosed at 400 milligrams twice daily for two doses on the first day, and then 200 milligrams twice daily on days two through five. Um, azithromycin was dosed at 500 milligrams once daily on the first day, followed by 250 milligrams once daily for the next four days. 
And then combination treatment was only used for select patients with severe COVID-19 and minimal risk factors, determined cardiac risk um, using electrocardiogram assessment. Um, they also did a range of statistical analyses, but multivariate Cox regression models and Kaplan-Meier survival curves were used to compare survival among treatment groups while controlling for the demographics, demographics pre-existing medical conditions, and clinical disease severity, which was um, important as we learned in the previous study that they kind of accounted for this. But um, bivariate comparisons of the four groups, which included hydroxychloroquine only, azithromycin only, the combination, and then no drugs, were made using analysis of variance or Kruska-Wallis test for continuous variables, and then Fisher exact or chi-square for categorical. Um, a propensity score was created for each patient based on a set of patient characteristics that were used in the Cox regression model. And based on that propensity score, they used one-to-one -one matching of patients that were given hydroxychloroquine at all, so either alone or in combination with azithromycin, and patients not given hydroxychloroquine at all um, based on that propensity score. And then those matched groups were placed in their own Cox regression analysis model um, for mortality prediction, and then a Kaplan-Meier survival curve for the two matched groups. So baseline, um, with the characteristics of the population, there were 2,541 consecutive patients. Um, they had a median age of 64, 51% were male, and 56% were African American. And then 52% of the patients had a BMI greater than or equal to 30, but that's not that surprising considering what we've um, seen with disease severity and BMI and hospitalization. But overall, the crude mortality rate was 18.1% in the entire cohort, but when you break that down by group, it was lowest at 13.5% with the hydroxychloroquine only group, at 20.1% with the combination group, 22.4% with azithromycin alone, and then 26.4% with no drugs at all. So the primary causes of mortality in this group were respiratory failure at 88%, so that was the largest, and then cardiac arrest and cardiopulmonary arrest along with multi-organ failure. Um, when multivariable Cox regression was used with uh, no drugs as the reference group, treatment with hydroxychloroquine alone decreased mortality by 66%, um, and that was significant. And then the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin decreased the mortality hazard ratio by 71%. Um, in this population, significant predictors of mortality were being older than 65 years old, having white race, um, having lower oxygen saturation on admission, and then ventilator use during admission. Um, the Kaplan-Meier survival curves, looking at all four groups, showed significant um, improved survival among patients with hydroxychloroquine alone and the combination therapy. Um, and you can see that that difference persisted even at 28 days after admission. So I don't know how much you guys can see, but the green line here is hydroxychloroquine alone, the black line is the combination, blue is azithromycin alone, and red is no drug. And then here is days of admission and then the survival probability. Um, they ended up choosing for their matched pair analysis 190 hydroxychloroquine patients and 190 no drug patients. Um, using that propensity score. So the Cox group resulted in a decreased uh, hazard ratio for mortality of 51%. And then as you can see here, the Kaplan-Meier survival curve with this group, um, the green is yes, hydroxychloroquine and the red is no, and that difference persisted at 28 days after admission. So, um, some of the key points in the discussion are that the benefits of hydroxychloroquine in this cohort as compared to previous studies 
um, could be related to this study population itself. So the fact that the disease course was standardized or the disease treatment course was standardized with safe dosing, they used inclusion criteria, um, took into account comorbidities and it was a larger cohort overall. Um, then they also mentioned that in this case, they were giving the treatment earlier on and because of the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and the hyperimmune response early on, it's kind of indicating that hydroxychloroquine might be beneficial if given early on in the disease course because of its antiviral and antithrombotic properties, but that it might not be very effective um, to be used as later therapy. Um, so some of the limitations were that it, of course, was retrospective, non-randomized, and non-blinded. Um, it also didn't include information on duration of symptoms before people were hospitalized, and the findings are limited to the hospitalized patient population. Um, but some notable qualities were that the use of um, a cohort of consecutive patients from a multi-hospital institution, the regularly updated and standardized institutional clinical treatment guidelines, the QTC interval-based algorithm specifically designed to ensure the safe use of hydroxychloroquine, a multiracial patient composition, confirmation of all patients um, in the cohort for infection with COVID-19 using PCR testing, and the control for various confounding factors, including patient characteristics and severity of illness. So I know that was a lot in a short amount of time. I didn't want to go, but does anyone have a question to go back to anything? Or comments, thoughts? Sarah yeah, is a, a really great summary. Um, I think, you. you know, the sort of the prevailing critique of this study right now is um, sort of uh, encapsulated by Tony Fauci saying it was confounded. And so I guess, the, you know, the question is, is there uncontrolled confounding in this analysis? And right. um, it seems like the biggest potential culprit for that would be the, um, the corticosteroid treatment in uh, in the in the patients that received the hydroxychloroquine compared to the no drug group, mm -hmm. did they did the authors mention that at all in the discussion? Was it? No, I don't believe they did. Okay, and I they didn't really elaborate much on because they said that the combination treatment was only used for select patients with severe COVID nineteen, but they did use in their propensity score matching. They included those who like it wasn't just the hydroxychloroquine only that they matched with, they matched with anyone who received any hydroxychloroquine. Okay. So there's something to that about that as well. Okay. It also looks like they accounted for the steroid use in that analysis too, if I'm reading this correctly. Yeah, I think I should have pulled up the, I should have put the um, table in, but I was on but they did you can look back at the paper and look at how they matched the with the 190 of each group they did an analysis and showed like the qualities of each group and the by patient matching and so i they might have included the steroids actually in that oh, okay but but you are right ryan just looking at their at least their table one you can see that the group's receiving hydroxychloroquine and, and the ones that didn't get anything, they're very different just along all these different characteristics. So there could be uh, definitely some kind of unmeasured confounding that they did not account for as well. Great, thanks, Cleo. Arnold, did you have a comment? It looks like you... Uh... The, only, the only thing that... Uh... I have heard is the propensity scores weren't calculated <laughs> properly. Uh, Emily said they did them backwards. Uh -oh. <laughs> <or something. laughs> I'm not really. Familiar. I haven't checked. 
were, so that wouldn't have been something I would have caught. So I apologize for that, but. No, that's okay. That's okay, Sierra. That's a, uh, it takes a, a very keen eye with propensity score. I mean, even, you know, I don't know that I would have caught that looking at it, so. But interesting. So a number of issues and uh, yeah, if the, pretend, if the propensity scores weren't calculated correctly, then it's probably should be retracted. <laughs> but. I was just thinking. I trust um, Emily, I, I, I can't, I wouldn't, uh, I think we need another keen eye to look at that. Agreed. Well, we must jump in at the end of the meeting, but um, I think based on the discussion of M bias in the book of Y by Professor Pearl, I think controlling for the collider here would result in M bias and their propensity score matching. That would, that, that would be one of the issues that may have happened in this uh, propensity score analysis. That's a great point, Iman. Kat, you were gonna say something? Yeah, um, I was, uh, first of all, good job today, everyone. And um, I was just thinking ahead, someone, I'm sorry, there's a lot of people that I'm not familiar with um, in this group, but someone had mentioned how like an underlying co-infection could have been driving um, one of the relationships between being treated with hydroxy and not. Um, and I know that there's a lot of talk about people being concerned of um, the flu season, like, being bad next to COVID. Um, so maybe there's some papers um, out that do some like forecasting on what that could look like, um, just as like a next idea for like a journal club topic as this wraps up before the semester starts up again. And yeah. It's an interesting thought. Thanks, Kat. We'll talk, maybe you and I can talk more offline about that. Yeah, um, sure. <clears throat> All right, everybody, I think we'll leave it there for today. So thanks um, for all your contributions and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye. Thank you. Good job, everybody. Thank you.